Good morning. My name is Scott Bush. Um, I happen to be managing director of J.P. Morgan, and we happen to be helping uh, fund this morning. Um, but I would say, um, more importantly, on behalf of uh, the leadership council here at, at Danforth, uh, we deeply appreciate you coming out and spending this morning with us talking about energy, renewable energy, and you know, hopefully some really impactful ideas for the future. Uh, this is um, our fifth Seeds for Change. So it's our fifth anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, every one of these events seem to get better and more interesting. Um, they're always thought-provoking. Um, and uh, we're so glad that you're all here to help us you know, spend some time thinking about you know, things that hopefully help us sort of transform our communities. Um, just a couple quick notes. One of them, which is actually not on my script, but I, if you have a phone, um, if you can make sure that it's turned off or uh, on vibrate or something, um, it will help uh, Amory here keep focused. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you very, very much uh, on behalf of all of us for you being here this morning. I'm here now to introduce my good friend Jim Carrington, um, who will introduce our very distinguished speaker. And uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to the Danforth Center Seeds of Change 2014 edition. Uh, first, I want to give my sincere thanks to the Danforth Leadership Council for hosting and organizing this event. It's one of the special things that they do each year. Uh, it's always, as Scott mentioned, thought-provoking, entertaining, and worth attending. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the leadership of the Danforth Leadership Council, Sandy Rogers, uh, Chairman, Wes Jones and Chris Danforth for chairing the Community Engagement Group, uh, which helps coordinate this event, uh, and Scott uh, Bush for moderating the event. After the speaker presents his remarks for 40 minutes or so, Scott will be convening uh, a uh, discussion uh, in front. So after the lecture is over, please stay in your seats as they take their position up here. Now speaking with our uh, distinguished speaker guest, Amory Lovins last night, and asked uh, what was the best introduction he's ever had? <laughs> and he said the best one was Amory Lovins needs no introduction. <laughs> and then he sat down. So you, you, you have no such luck this morning, Amory. Uh, rather, uh, I'm going to say a few words about you. Uh, Amory is a Harvard and Oxford University educated physicist, although he'll tell you he's a reformed physicist. And he's the co-founder, chairman, and chief scientist of the independent nonprofit Think and Do Tank, the Rocky Mountain Institute. Since 1982, the Rocky Mountain Institute has served uh, and is has a mission of to drive the efficient and restorative use of resources. The Institute focuses on unlocking market-based solutions that can be replicated and, impl and implemented now. For over 40 years, Amory Levins has been a leading voice, thought leader, and innovator on energy sources, uses, designs, economics, and sustainability. Among 31 books he's authored or co-authored, his latest, Reinventing Fire, Bold Business Solutions for the New Energy Era, show just how by mid-century, mid-21st century, we can drastically increase energy efficiency, phase out most fossil fuels, dramatically grow both renewable energy and a robust economy, and by the way, reduce carbon emissions and make serious headway addressing climate change. Amory has been named one of the world's most uh, influential 100 people by time. He's a 1993 MacArthur Fellow, the recipient of 11 honorary degrees, recipient of the Blue Planet, Volvo, Zayed, Onassis, on and on and on. It, it really, <laughs> the list of honors and awards really doesn't stop. Uh, but rather than read all of Amory's awards, uh, which uh, if you want, I can, <laughs> I can loan you a copy of the, of the list, the full list. It, it takes a full page, uh, roughly six-point font. 
Rather than do that, it would be easier to simply tell you which awards Amory has not won. <laughs> it's a far shorter list. Uh, it's, only, it's only three awards, and I, but I'd like to read them to you. Amory has never won the Wally, drag racing's most prestigious trophy. <laughs> He's never won that one. He's never won, never, the Cooper's Hill Gloucester Cheese Rolling Competition. <laughs> and Amory has never been recognized by the American Mustache Institute as the Robert Goulet Memorial Mustached American of the Year. He has never won that award, though, uh, Aaron, I think he needs a nomination. Uh, on that note, please join me in welcoming to the stage our 2014 Seas of Change speaker, Amory Lovins. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jim. After that gracious introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> And thank you for being so kind as to invite me here and uh, to all of you for showing up. But, uh, I'm going to summarize <clears throat> the uh, basic message of a business book called Reinventing Fire. If, by the way, you want it electronically, I do not recommend the Kindle version because it's very graphics layout intensive, but the, the Google Books version will let you see all that. Uh, it was prepared over six quarters by 60 colleagues and me at Rocky Mountain Institute and published three years ago with forwards by the uh, president of Shell Oil and the then chair of the biggest nuclear and third biggest coal-fired utility in the country. This might rather surprise you when you hear what's in it. Uh, <clears throat> and we started with this rather odd public conversation America has about energy, which if boiled down and clarified would be a stupid multiple choice test. Namely, would you rather die of A, oil wars, or B, climate change, or C, nuclear holocaust, or D, all of the above? Hmm, I missed one. Oh, or E, none of the above. That's the choice we're seldom offered. But my colleagues and I asked, what if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we even reinvent fire? And we chose that big poetic title because a long time ago, fire made us human, then fossil fuels made us modern, but now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That is now feasible. In fact, it works better and costs less than what we are doing so let's see how. Four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year four cubic miles of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo. Uh, as a member of the National Petroleum Council, I should tell you, and it's true, that those fossil fuels have created our wealth, built our civilization, enriched the lives of billions of people. But the rising costs to our security, economy, health, environment are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire changes two big stories, oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon into the air. These two stories are only about 1% connected. They're quite distinct, but they are similarly concentrated in their uses. Three quarters of US oil fuels transportation, three quarters of US electricity powers buildings, the rest of both runs factories, so very efficient vehicles and land use buildings, factories can save a lot of oil and coal, which makes two-fifths uh, two of the electricity, and of course natural gas that can displace both oil and coal. But today's energy system is not only inefficient, it is also disconnected, uh, dirty, aging, insecure. It needs refurbishment. By 2050, though, it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal vehicles, buildings, and factories, all relying 
uh, <clears throat> on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So in the United States, we can eliminate our addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use a third less natural gas while switching to threefold more efficient use and three quarters renewable supplies. That's the transition I'll describe. And our team found that by 2050, this transition could cost the United States $5 trillion less in net present value than business as usual, assuming that all external or hidden costs, including carbon emissions, are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, yet this cheaper energy system could support a 158% bigger, that is 2.6-fold bigger economy, uh, all without needing any oil or coal or, for that matter, nuclear energy. And this transition would need no new inventions and no new national taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws, thus end running Washington gridlock. That's the most surprising part, so I'll say it again. Uh, I'm going to tell you how the United States can get completely off oil and coal, $5 trillion cheaper, with no act of Congress led by business for profit. And <clears throat> the needed policy changes can all be made administratively or at a state level, which is where we have always made most of our energy policy anyway. Uh, and thus, <clears throat> we could use America's most effective institutions, private enterprise co-evolving with civil society, sped by military innovation, to go around our least effective institutions. And whether you care most about profits and jobs and competitive advantage, or about national security, or about environmental stewardship, creation care, climate, public health, uh, reinventing fire, makes sense and makes money. General Eisenhower reputedly said that expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. In other words, rather than chopping a tough problem into ever smaller bite-sized pieces, we need to move the boundaries out until they include what the solution requires. Therefore, in reinventing fire, we integrated all four sectors that use energy, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity. And we have several decades of, of deep practical experience in all four of those. And we also integrated four kinds of innovation, not just technology and public policy, but also design, the way technologies are combined, and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. These four kinds of innovation together give you a lot more than the sum of the parts, especially in creating some deeply disruptive business opportunities. Where to start? Well, we're paying in this country $2 billion a day for oil, plus another $4 billion a day for just the hidden economic and military costs of our oil dependence. And since nearly half the oil goes to cars, automobiles, let's, let's start by making autos oil-free. Now, two-thirds of the energy needed to move a typical car is caused by its weight. And every unit of energy we save at the wheels by taking out weight or drag or rolling resistance saves another six units of energy we don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So it saves altogether seven units of fuel back at the tank. Huge leverage. And yet, <clears throat> uh, for the past quarter century, epidemic obesity has made our two-ton steel autos gain weight twice as fast as we have. <laughs> However, uh, today we have ultra-light, ultra-strong materials like carbon fiber composites that can make dramatic weight savings snowball uh, and can make uh, autos simpler and surprisingly cheaper to build. Now, lighter and more slippery autos need less force to move them. So their engine gets smaller, and then we can afford to change it to an electric propulsion system because we'll need two or three times fewer of those costly batteries or fuel cells. Therefore, the sticker price can fall to about today's level, and the driving cost per mile is much lower from the start. So this specific sequence of innovations can transform automakers from ringing tiny savings out of essentially Victorian steel stamping and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three mutually reinforcing uh, technologies, ultralight materials, their manufacturing into structures, and electric propulsion. 
And if you are exploiting three steep and synergistic learning curves while your competitor is out on the flat side of one of them, uh, you tend to win. Now, the sales of such vehicles can grow and their prices can drop even faster with a temporary policy called a fee bait, that is, rebates for buying an efficient new auto paid for by fees on inefficient ones. And this is now done in various forms in six countries. The biggest such program in France, uh, just in its first two years, tripled the speed of improving auto efficiency. So the resulting shift to electric autos will be as game-changing as shifting from small refinements in typewriters to the dramatic Moore's Law driven gains in computers. Of course, computers and IT are now America, uh, America's biggest industry. Typewriter makers have vanished. So vehicle fitness, taking the obesity out of the vehicle, uh, opens a powerful new automotive competitive strategy that doubles the oil saving in 40 years, but also can make affordable the electrification that can save the rest of the oil. America or Japan or China could lead this next automotive revolution the barriers are formidable, but they're much more cultural than they're technical or economic, and we're helping the automotive leaders to tackle them. Uh, interestingly, the current leader is Germany. Last year, Volkswagen uh, began low-volume production of this 235-mile-a-gallon carbon fiber plug-in hybrid two-seater, and BMW began ramping up mid-volume production on which they've now doubled their target uh, on this uh, battery electric carbon fiber car, 124 miles per gallon equivalent. Uh, <clears throat> Audi, a couple of years ago, showed a carbon fiber plug-in hybrid rated at over 250 miles a gallon equivalent. Uh, and uh, uh, BMW, by the way, confirmed that the carbon fiber making the passenger cell of this vehicle is indeed paid for by needing fewer batteries. And their CEO gives speeches saying, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker, because they can look across Munich to where Olympia used to make excellent typewriters. Uh, there are some interesting things that American business can bring to the party. Uh, I brought along my carbon cap today. Uh, <laughs> this is a carbon fiber and thermoplastic test piece for military ballistic helmets that have been shipping for a few years. And if I hit it, you'll, you can tell from the sound it's extremely strong and stiff. Uh, let's pass it around as long as I get it back afterwards. Uh, don't worry about dropping it, Scott. It's tougher than titanium. Actually, uh, Tom Friedman whacked it with a sledgehammer as hard as he could, and he couldn't even scuff it. Uh, now, the technique we use to make that is now refined and sold to a German tier one, and uh, it can do, um, I hope it's gonna get down here too. Uh, it, it can now make a two by two meter complex part in one minute. Uh, and if you, if you do that kind of scaling to automotive cost and speed, but with aerospace performance, uh, you can save four-fifths of the capital needed in automaking. You can save a lot of lives because this stuff can absorb six to 12 times the crash energy per pound of steel. And you can also save oil equivalent just in this country to discovering one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC by drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. And those, <coughs> those, those nega barrels, those save barrels under Detroit turn out to cost 18 bucks each which is <clears throat> to pay for the electrification, since as I'll explain in a minute, the ultralighting is approximately free. And that saved oil is of course domestic, secure, carbon free, and inexhaustible. Now, <clears throat> those German cars use a, a process that's somewhat faster and a lot more economical than the hand layup and autoclave way we make carbon fiber race cars, but uh, still costlier than regular automaking. And I was wondering if we could bridge the thousand-fold gap in price. That is, you would need to make those race car techniques about a thousand times faster and higher volume to compete in a high-volume car business. And then I met a young engineer at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works who had just led the design of this Joint Strike Fighter airframe that was 95% carbon, one-third lighter, but two-thirds cheaper because it was designed from scratch to be made optimally out of carbon, not metal. Uh, 
uh, it was a little too radical uh, and activated the immune system of the joint strike fighter community, so he quit, and one bounce later I was able to hire him to lead the design of this uh, midsize SUV made of carbon fiber, which we did with a couple of European Tier 1s 14 years ago. And uh, it would get 67 miles a gallon on uh, gasoline or 114 on hydrogen and uh, <clears throat> be very impressive, compromise, uh, uncompromised luxury SUV uh, carrying five adults in comfort and up to two cubic meters of cargo, very brisk performance. Uh, but what's really fun is if you look inside, uh, there are only 14 body parts. <clears throat> now, a standard steel SUV would have 10 or 20 times more parts than that, each made with an average of four progressive steel stamping die sets. So this is 14 die sets instead of four times, 10 or 20 times more than that. So you save about 98 or 99 percent of the tooling cost. And by the way, um, <clears throat> this is an airframe. It's suspended from rings, not built up from a tub. Uh, each of these parts, so, you know, so it's immensely strong and stiff, each of these parts can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The biggest part on the side I can briefly lift with one finger. Uh, and then the parts snap precisely together for bonding so you don't need the robotic body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you don't need the paint shop either. Those are the two hardest and costliest parts of making the car or steps in making the car. They just went away. Um, therefore, the four-fifth less capital requirement. And um, also the propulsion system gets about three times smaller. So th those simplifications and downsizings together pay for the carbon fiber. That's why the ultra lighting is free. And the carbon fiber itself is, is now starting to get a whole lot cheaper. The record holder, uh, which we understand used the same design techniques that, that we shared with Toyota uh, from our uh, project you just saw. Uh, this, this is a um, four-seater uh, plug-in hybrid that has the interior volume of a Prius, half the fuel use, and a third the weight, 420 kilograms. Uh, and uh, I think that's the public record holder. And uh, we are currently helping the Chinese government plan a technical symposium to explore a China-led automotive leapfrog on these lines that could transform the global competitive landscape. Now, the same physics and the same business logic also apply to big vehicles. Um, Walmart's heavy trucks are using smarter design and better logistics to haul each case using last year 44% less energy than they used in 2005. But just the technological fuel saving available in heavy trucks uh, can reach a factor three, that is two-thirds saving. And if you combine that with the triple to quintupled efficiency airplanes now on design screens at MIT and Boeing and NASA, uh, you'd end up with a $0.9 trillion net present valued fuel saving. In both heavy and light vehicles, today's military revolution in energy efficiency is going to speed all of these advances in the civilian sector, which uses over 50 times as much oil. Much as military R&D gave us the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine industry, the microchip industry, only this time the leverage can speed America's path off oil so we don't need to fight over oil, and then our warfighters can have nega missions in the Persian Gulf, mission unnecessary. Uh, as an advisor of the Chief of Naval Operations, I can assure you they really like that idea. So 40 years hence, a far more mobile U.S. economy <coughs> can be using no oil and saving or displacing each barrel for what works out to about 25 bucks instead of buying it for well over 100 saves $4 trillion net present value. And if I'd counted just the hidden economic and military costs of U.S. oil dependence, that would be $12 trillion. Pretty soon you're talking real money. Now, to get mobility without oil, just phase out the oil, we can first get efficient and then switch fuels. So the savings baked into the government forecast are in magenta. Here's the vehicle fitness that they didn't count because by law the projections cannot count basic innovation. Uh, here's more productive use of vehicles. Uh, 
<clears throat> including vehicles meet IT. And then those 125 to 240 mile per gallon equivalent autos can run on any combination of hydrogen, electricity, or, three, uh, or uh, advanced biofuels, and the heavy trucks and airplanes could realistically run on advanced biofuels or hydrogen, or the trucks could even burn natural gas, but none of the vehicles will need oil. And the maximum biofuels we might need is about 3 million barrels a day, which could be made two-thirds from waste and could be made entirely without using cropland and without harming soil or climate. In fact, we would probably pay farmers and ranchers to take carbon out of the air and stick it back in tilth where it belongs. So our little team in Colorado speeds these oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture, where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We stick little needles in carefully selected sites in partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon to get that uh, <coughs> chi, that entrepreneurial juice uh, flowing. Uh, and this long transition is, is already so well underway that even five years ago, some mainstream analysts were starting to see peak oil, not in supply, but in demand. Uh, <clears throat> Deutsche Bank, City, Financial Times, and others are, have now forecast that world oil use may peak in this decade and then decline, because like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. However, the electrified autos that help that happen need not burden the electricity system. Rather, when smart autos exchange energy and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid flexibility <coughs> and distributed storage that help the grid uh, to integrate varying solar and wind power. So electrified autos actually make the auto and electricity problems easier to solve together than separately. And they also converge the oil story for the first time with our second big story, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those twin revolutions in electricity are already bringing more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions to that sector than any other because basically we've got 21st century technology and speed colliding head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Now, changing how we make electricity gets easier if we need less of it. Today, most of it is wasted, and efficiency technologies keep improving faster than they're applied. That is, the, the low-hanging fruit keeps growing back faster than you can pick it. Uh, so the, the potential savings keep getting bigger and cheaper. But as buildings and industry catch up and start to get efficient faster than they grow, uh, America's electricity use, instead of growing 1% a year as officially forecast, could decrease 1% a year even after allowing for the extra use by the efficient electric cars. And in fact, this is already well underway. U.S. demand for electricity and also for gasoline, peaked in 2007. It's been drifting down ever since. In 2012 alone, the amount of electricity after weather adjustment uh, needed to make a dollar real GDP fell by 3.4% in one year. And we can keep demand dropping by, as it has the past three years running, and five of the past six years, by reasonably accelerating existing trends at historically reasonable rates. Specifically, over the next 40 years, buildings, which use, I'll remind you, three quarters of our electricity, can triple or quadruple their energy efficiency, saving $1.4 trillion net present value at an internal rate of return averaging 33%. In other words, the savings are worth four times what they cost. Industry can also accelerate and double its energy productivity with a 21% IRR. And to do these things by 2050, we would just need to ramp up national average adoption of energy efficiency to the levels already achieved nine years ago in the Pacific Northwest states. Now, a key to such big savings is a disruptive innovation we've been hatching at, at RMI for a few decades called integrative design. It often makes very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings. So you get expanding returns instead of diminishing returns. 
That's how our 2010 retrofit is saving two-fifths of the energy in the Empire State Building. We started off by setting up a little temporary window factory down here on a vacant floor and using it to remanufacture all 6,514 windows into super windows that are four times as insulating and about perfect in letting in light but blocking heat. And those plus other improvements would cut the maximum cooling load uh, by a third. Then instead of adding bigger chillers, we could simply renovate smaller chillers, saving $17 million, which paid for most of the improvements, and cut the payback to just three years. That's the same payback that a major energy service company had offered, but they would save six times less energy than we did because they were optimizing components in isolation, whereas we were optimizing the whole building as a system. Uh, our latest cost-effective deep retrofit of a difficult 48-year-old federal office complex in Denver is expected to save 70%, making it more efficient than the best new U.S. office building. However, our new office on which we, we break ground next month is expected to be twice as efficient as that best new office building was four years ago. The state of the art keeps moving pretty fast. Um, Let's try another uh, kind of building, namely go to my own house. I'm a farmer, a banana farmer. I live at 7,100 feet in the Rockies near Aspen where it used to go to minus 47F on occasion. This is uh, some months ago when we had 27 inches of snow in 24 hours. Um, and we've had up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud, so it's not a reliably sunny climate. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, if you, well, this, this house helped inspire over 30,000 European passive buildings that, like ours, have no heating system and have roughly normal construction costs. And they don't have to look like this to work like this. Now, if you come into this atrium under the glass that insulates like 16 sheets of glass, but looks like two and costs less than three, this is what it looks like in a February snowstorm. You can see two of the five banana crops that were then ripening. Here are some more recent ones that weighed 30 kilos and harvested themselves recently by pulling down the tree. Uh, <laughs> Self-harvesting bananas, our latest innovation. Uh, and uh, when I moved in in 84, uh, Ms. House was saving about 99% of the usual spaced water heating energy and about 90% of the household electricity and half the water, but all with a 10-month payback. Uh, because, for example, the things we did to get rid of the heating system cost 1100 bucks less up front than it would have cost to put in a heating system. Uh, now, today's technologies, which we just retrofitted, are a lot better than what we had in 1983 or so. Uh, so we've retrofitted them, and we're measuring how much better they are. What we've learned so far is that the measuring equipment seems to use more electricity than the lights and appliances we're measuring. Uh, now, we, we have used integrative design to eliminate air conditioning in uh, hot, dry climates up to 115F, which is not a limit, uh, with better comfort and lower construction cost. Others have used it in steamy Bangkok to save 90% of the air conditioning energy with better comfort and normal construction cost. Probably about everybody in the world lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. Uh, but wherever you live, the key is integrative design that gives many benefits from each expenditure. So this white arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Integrative design can also increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry. Dow, for example, has invested a billion dollars in energy efficiency, so far returned $9 billion in savings. But there's a lot more to do. For example, three-fifths of the world's electricity uh, runs motors. Half of that runs pumps and fans. And you can make all that equipment a lot better. Uh, <clears throat> but first, we should capture bigger and cheaper savings that are normally ignored. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, move liquid through pipes. But a typical industrial pumping loop was redesigned to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps and motors and controls, but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. 
and this also in, you know, shrinks the pumping equipment and its capital costs. Uh, this isn't new technology, it's just rearranging our metal furniture as designers. When I did that in uh, some piping we were putting in our own house, we got a 97% saving and it was cheaper. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean for the electricity that's three-fifths used in motors? Well, from the coal burned in the power plant, there are so many compounding losses that only 5%, er, sorry, 10% of the fuel energy actually comes out the pipe as flow. But let's take those compounding losses from left to right and turn them around backwards, and then they comp become compounding savings. So every unit of flow or friction we save in the pipe compounds back to save 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and <clears throat> what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components also get smaller and the whole system gets cheaper. Uh, our team has lately found such snowballing energy savings in over $40 billion worth of diverse industrial redesigns from this Hewlett Packard data center and Texas Instruments chip fab to Rio Tinto and Anglo-American mines and Shell hydrocarbon facilities and a bunch of other diverse stuff, uh, including uh, some across the street. Uh, <clears throat> but typically our, our retrofit designs save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with two or three year paybacks. Uh, while our new facility designs save about 40 to 90 odd percent with generally lower capital cost. Now, needing less electricity because of more efficient buildings and factories would ease and speed the shift to new sources of electricity, chiefly renewables. China is leading their explosive growth and their plummeting cost, shown here on a logarithmic scale for photovoltaic or solar power modules and for wind farms. And uh, <clears throat> both of those in US sites, uh, good US sites, will already beat new combined cycle gas po power plants. Uh, some new solar power in the western US is priced under a nickel a kilowatt hour, and wind power in the Midwest wind belt under two cents. Uh, in Germany, the installed photovoltaic systems on your house roof actually cost only half as much as they do here, uh, even though we all buy the same equipment, because the Germans have much more streamlined installation methods, which now we're starting to learn. Uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, today in about 20 of the United States, uh, entrepreneurs will happily come to your house and put up uh, solar power on your roof with no money down, soon it'll be cash back, and beat your utility bill. Uh, such unregulated products could ultimately add up to a virtual utility that bypasses the power company, just like your cell phone bypassed wireline phone companies. That sort of thing gives electric utility executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it's happening right now in, in Hawaii, where 10 or 15 percent of the Oahu households uh, are on solar power, and many of those have also bought batteries, which are getting dramatically cheaper, and they've dropped off the grid altogether. So we wrote a paper recently called The Economics of Grid Defection, pointing out that that ability to drop off the grid and save money uh, would spread across the country uh, well within the lives of existing utility assets. And then reading that, Barclays downgraded the whole U.S. utility sector one notch, saying that their <laughs> business models are not ready for so much competition, which is true. Um, or, of course, incumbent electricity providers could turn that insurgency into a major business opportunity, and we're helping them do that, too. We actually have two electricity practices. One works with incumbents, one with insurgents, because competition is good. <laughs> now, <clears throat> here's the big picture. Uh, worldwide, starting in 2008, half of all the new, new generating capacity added has been renewables. This graph shows the main modern renewables, wind and photovoltaics, and it shows not their cumulative addition, but their annual addition. These are very, very big numbers. Um, <clears throat> In 2012, China made more wind power than nuclear power, which they have the world's most aggressive program, and they made more new electricity from non-hydro renewables, mainly these two, than from coal plus nuclear power. Last year, China added more solar power capacity than the United States has added since we invented it 60 years ago. Renewables were 68% of the new capacity added in China last year, 72% in Europe. 
The global clean energy sector that's brought Europe over a million renewable energy jobs has created more American solar jobs than we have coal or steel jobs. And those solar jobs are growing 10 times faster than general employment. So worldwide, by the end of this year, renewables, excluding big hydro dams, will have invested one and three quarter trillion dollars in the past decade. And in each of the past three years, these and other modern renewable investments have gotten a quarter trillion dollars per year of private investment and added over 80 billion watts a year. They have surpassed the total global capacity of nuclear power. They'll surpass its energy output by next year. Uh, <coughs> nuclear's uh, net additions actually turn negative even before Fukushima. And coal and nuclear orders generally are fading away because they have no business case. They cost too much and they have too much financial risk. But modern renewables also scale up in a fundamentally different way. You know, we used to build just giant cathedral-like power plants that took years to license, more years to build. But meanwhile, every year you can build a factory which each year thereafter will produce enough solar modules that each year thereafter each of these little symbols represents as much solar electricity being produced as your cathedral will produce once it was built. So in this little example with this a power plant that takes seven years to build and with a similar total investment, you can get 15 times as much electricity over the first 10 years. This helps explain why solar power is scaling worldwide faster than cell phones. But we're often told that only coal and nuclear plants can keep the lights on because they are 24-7 while wind power and photovoltaics are variable and hence supposedly unreliable. Neither part of that statement is true. First of all, variable does not mean unpredictable. Uh, here's how accurately the French grid operator forecast the country's wind power output in a stormy winter month. This is the forecast for one day ahead versus the actual one day later. I'll bet they wish they could forecast demand that well. Uh, <coughs> And then, secondly, we built the grid because no generator is 24-7. They all break. The big ones break about 10 or 12 percent of the time, and when that happens, you lost a billion watts in milliseconds, often for weeks or months, and often without warning. Now, grids routinely handle that intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. And in exactly the same way, but often at lower cost, grids can handle the forecastable variations of solar and wind power by backing up those variable renewables mainly with other renewables of other kinds or in other places. So highly reliable power can come from largely or wholly renewable sources when they are forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and location. Let me illustrate this with an aggressive but instructive simulation from Texas where the grid is isolated from the rest of the country. It's a rather difficult case. And in a typical summer week in 2050, you'd expect a load shape like this, or if you use the electricity in a profitably efficient way, a smaller, less peaky load, but still you need 30-odd billion watts. Let's do all of this with renewables, 86% on an annual basis coming from a combination of wind and photovoltaics. You can see how variable they are. Um, and then the other 14% from other renewables that are what's called dispatchable, that is you can have them whenever you want. So that's geothermal, small hydro, solar thermal electric with heat storage, burning municipal solid waste, burning feedlot biogas in combustion turbines, burning energy studies, that's my favorite. Um, uh, and, uh, and so now we got 100% renewable supply, but as you can see, it's not a great match to the load shape. So let's now take the surpluses and put them into two kinds of distributed storage, ice storage air conditioning and smart charging and discharging of electric vehicles, uh, both fully deployed. And then we can recover that energy when needed and fill in the last bits with unobtrusively flexible demand. Now all the moving parts fit together. You've got 100% renewable supply. You're delivering reliable power every hour of the year with only 5% left over. So the economics should be quite good. Now, this is not just theory. Um, some countries' grid operators are already integrating variable renewables in exactly this way. So last year, 25% of German electricity consumption 
uh, was renewable. First half of this year, it's been nearly a third. But four other European countries not rich in hydro ha are getting about half their electricity last year from renewables. Uh, Denmark, at least 47%, Scotland, 46 Spain, 45 Portugal, 58 uh, they didn't add bulk storage. Their electricity is generally more reliable than ours for Denmark and Germany, 10 times as reliable as ours. And by the way, back home, Iowa and South Dakota are over a quarter wind powered. The lights stay on just fine. So much for the supposed reliability limits to wind and solar power. Uh, and the, the general principle here is, is quite straightforward. Uh, as my colleague Clay Stranger says, it's like the way a conductor leads a symphony orchestra through a score. No instrument plays all the time, but beautiful music is continuously produced by the ensemble. And the National Renewable Energy Lab has analyzed this for the United States. This is a, an August week in 2050, showing how, again, nothing's running all the time, uh, except the sort of dark gray ones, some of those, those are, are fossil and nuclear plants that haven't quite phased out yet in their scenario, but they can later. And uh, because we have a grid and its use is coordinated, uh, the electricity is continuously produced. Now, an important part of this story, uh, as we analyzed it using the same model, is distributed generation uh, Denmark, for example, in three decades has gone from a few big coal plants to a constellation of wind farms in blue, 86% owned by farmers in their communities and co-ops, uh, and ag waste cogeneration in brown, and they are pretty close now to phasing out the last few coal plants. They're planning to go 100% renewable on all, on all energy at essentially no extra cost, and they're reorganizing their grid in a cellular fashion that makes cascading blackouts impossible. So these mass producible, modular, quickly deployable technologies accessible to many market actors uh, are what the economist calls micropower. That's renewables minus big hydro plus cogeneration. And micropower now makes a fourth of the world's electricity and accounts for half the new capacity in the world. So 48% of the world's electricity last year was made with little or no carbon release. We're doing better than you might think. Then there's America, where we have this aging, dirty, insecure electricity system that we have to replace anyway by 2050. And we could replace it by more of what we got, or new nuclear and so-called clean coal, or centralized renewables, or say half distributed renewables. And those four futures turn out to cost the same, but they differ profoundly in their risks around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, climate, and health, seven kinds of risk. For example, we have this over-centralized grid that is very vulnerable to cascading and a, a potentially economy-shattering blackouts caused by operational problems, you know, squirrels, tree limbs, uh, solar storms, superstorms, earthquakes, cyber attack, physical attack. But that blackout risk disappears and all the other six risks are best managed with distributed renewables reorganized into local microgrids that normally interconnect and exchange power freely but can stand a load of need. They can disconnect fractally, reconnect seamlessly. That is the Pentagon strategy for supplying power to military bases because they need their stuff to work. Well, so do the rest of us whom <laughs> they're defending. So <laughs> we designed our house that way. We don't even know when the grid goes down. And at about the same cost as business as usual, that resilient grid architecture could maximize national security and community and family security, customer choice, uh, innovation, entrepreneurial opportunity. So let me summarize the electricity story. Together, efficient use and diverse distributed renewable resilient supply are starting to transform the whole sector. Utilities used to build just giant power plants, coal, nuclear, gas, maybe a little efficiency of renewables. And we would reward those utilities as we still do uh, in 34 states, I believe, including yours and mine, for selling you more electricity. However, if we reward them instead for cutting your bill, the investment quickly shifts other way up 
towards efficiency, renewables, uh, and uh, ways to meld them all together reliably. Uh, and that, that is most of all true in the 30-odd states where demand-side resources are allowed to bid in the same auctions as supply, and they generally win because they're cheaper. So our energy future is not fate but choice, and that choice is very flexible. Back in 1975, government and industry insisted that the amount of energy needed to make a dollar of real GDP could never go down, and I heretically said it could go down threefold, what happened? Well, it's gone down by over twofold so far. We're doing pretty well, except now we have much better technologies. We have integrative design, more refined marketing and finance and delivery channels. So now we can see very clearly how to triple efficiency all over again at only a third the cost we used to think. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it and integrate it. The results may at first seem astonishing. They even surprised us a bit. But as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Uh, big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> now, combine the electricity and oil revolutions, and you have the really big story, reinventing fire, where business enabled and sped by smart policies in mindful markets can lead our country, and I dare say others, completely off oil and coal by 2050, saving five trillion bucks, growing the economy 2.6 fold, strengthening national security, and by eliminating oil and coal, by the way, cutting fossil carbon emissions by 82 to 86 percent. Now, if you like any of those outcomes, any one or more will do, you could support this transition without having to like every outcome and without having to agree about which outcome is most important. So focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. And it turns out these best buys are also the most effective solutions to the big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. You may wonder, so what does this look like in China? Because the answer is going to be vital to the security and prosperity of both our countries. China's burning more coal than the rest of the world put together, although it just started to go down this year, um, even as the economy grows. Um, China's the leading coal importer, oil importer, carbon emitter, energy user, and pretty soon they'll have a bigger economy than we do. So we've organized a collaboration with the top uh, energy analytic and policy shop sponsored by the National Development and Reform Commission. Um, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs China Energy Group, and we're now over halfway through a, a uniquely rigorous and economically explicit two-year effort to apply the logic I've just described for the U.S. Uh, to China using Chinese models, data, modelers, conditions, examples. Uh, this exercise is aimed to inform the 13th five-year plan whose energy authors form our customer group, our advisory panel of ministers and state councilors. And our preliminary results uh, are finding that China could probably meet its official growth projections of a six-fold bigger economy in 2050 using about the same amount of energy as now and getting half to three quarters of it from renewables, which implies at least 15 times more GDP from each unit of fossil fuel. And it's gratifying that in the United States in the first three years of this 40-year journey, the actual declines in energy intensity, that's a cold winter, and this is not weather adjusted, and in electric intensity are tracking nicely to target, and we're a bit ahead on renewable electricity production. So our little team at, at our nonprofit Rocky Mountain Institute is helping smart companies get unstuck and speed this journey via various sectoral initiatives and projects. <coughs> Of course, there's a lot of old thinking still around, too. The former oilman, Marie Strong, said not all the fossils are in the fuels. Um, <laughs> but as, as DuPont's former chairman, uh, Edgar Wollard, reminded us, uh, organizations hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because in the long run, they won't be around. 
what I've described for you is not just a once in a civilization business opportunity. It's one of the greatest transformations in the history of our species. Because we humans are inventing a new fire, not dug from below, but flowing from above. I've even heard theologians talk about energy from hell and energy from heaven. And the new fire is quite different. Uh, it is not scarce, but bountiful. Not local, but everywhere. Not transient, but permanent. Not costly, but free. And but for the transitional tail of natural gas and a little biofuel grown in ways that sustain and endure, this new fire is flameless and efficiently used. It really could do our work without working our undoing. Each of you owns a piece of that $5 trillion prize. Our book describes how you can capture that opportunity. So with the conversation begun at reinventingfire.com, let me invite each of you to engage with us, with each other, with everybody around you to help make the world healthier, richer, fairer, cooler, and safer by together reinventing fire. Thank you. Well, Amory, that was fantastic. I'm sure I said nothing controversial. Uh, there was a couple things that would I would say fall in the con controversial category, um, but um, that's why you're here. Um, we deeply appreciate uh, your commitment to showing up and sharing us your thoughts. Um, you know, I, I thought maybe just beginning uh, a question that's broader and more international would be a good place to start. Because you know, last night we briefly talked about Germany. We briefly talked about an article that was written um, in late August um, in the Wall Street Journal about you know the increase in the cost of power, you know, going up significantly in Germany. This is at the same time where Europe is sort of struggling to get their sort of economic footing back. Um, and um, you know, I, I'm I think one, many of us are wondering. Uh, with those kinds of dynamic economic pressures on an economy, um, how, do, how do the German, Germans need to think about it differently, and what have we sh should we be learning from their experience? Well, the reason they think about it differently is they actually know what's happening in Germany, and what you read in the journal is consistent with, shall we say, a uh, rather artful disinformation campaign that's been run for upwards of two years to try to persuade the rest of the world that doesn't read German, uh, that the Energiewende is a failure rather than a success. It has some warts, and, and they're figuring out some stuff as they go. But on the whole, it's a stunning success, so much so that it's, it's created a uh, loss of half the market cap for the major utilities that bet against it and thought it couldn't happen. Right. Uh, what you read about in the increase in residential rates is more than half due to the government's having loaded onto households the renewable levy that was supposed to be paid by industry. It's a several billion euro a year cross subsidy, and many industries were even exempted illegally from grid fees for the services they receive. And meanwhile, without having to pay uh, for the renewables uh, acquisitions, they have seen wholesale prices which the larger ones more or less pay, dropped by 61% in five years, making German industry much more competitive, uh, driving record power exports from Germany. They set new records every year. That is, by the way, the reason they're burning more uh, or, or making more coal-fired electricity, although lately burning less coal to do it because their plants get more efficient. Uh, it's entirely for export, mainly to uh, France and Holland. And they're a consistent net exporter to France. The German uh, energy intensive industries are out competing their French rivals, as the French loudly complain, because they have cheaper electricity. And by the way, the renewables fee on households is based on the difference between the cost of renewables, which keeps falling, and the wholesale price, which falls even faster. So it did go up a bit. It's now stabilized. And it, it's not. Uh, much of a political issue in Germany, although you would think everybody's up in arms about it. Uh, and part of the reason it isn't is that until August 1st, it was easy 
for householders to invest as little as 500 bucks or so in their own or somebody else's renewables. So half the renewables in Germany are owned by individuals, uh, co-ops, communities, but <clears throat> the conservative government has now largely shut that off by shifting the balance of power back toward the big players and stopping the democratization of the energy system, and that's causing a good deal more protest. Yeah, thank you. I have so, four blogs on this, and if any of the people last night who asked about Germany want, I have, I think, nine copies with me of a blog I did comparing German and Japanese developments. This is at Forbes.com, and it explains how the Fukushima accident, due to opposite policies, was a loss for Japan and a win for Germany. Which is an, where I was going next, which is now we're going across to the Pacific. So you have Japan, who had an extraordinarily awful experience um, losing a huge power plant, um, brownouts, blackouts, a, a, a massive you know, sort of breakdown of the whole energy system. They need to come up with a new energy policy, and they need to come up with something fast, because they're not going to build more nukes, ever. Hmm. What does that look like for Japan? <laughs> I spent a lot of time there, too, over the past few decades. and. Uh, it's fascinating how the policies are exactly opposite. <clears throat> the, before Fukushima, Japan and Germany each got nearly 30% of their electricity from nuclear power. Uh, when the accident happened, uh, of course, Japan lost all of its nuclear output, and they just have a tiny bit of it back now and mm -hmm. a lot of the rest of it, although still carried on the books as operable, may never restart. Right. Uh, and what they did was save a lot of electricity by curtailment, privation, and discomfort, uh, and import a lot of expensive fossil fuels to replace what they'd lost. So their bills went up, their rates went up, their carbon emissions went up, uh, and they still had inadequate supplies, and they're still squeaking by. Now, the reason for that is basically that their policy is designed to protect the old energy system, not enable the new one. Uh, they have virtually outlawed wind power. It's just a few percent of the renewable additions after they supposedly reformed the power system and brought in feed-in tariffs, German style, but at three times the level. Um, <clears throat> but there are special restrictions on wind power, and actually the 10 regional monopoly utilities are free to reject any renewable power they don't want that competes with their own assets, because they own the wires. They can reject it for any reason or for no reason, and they do. They say they're afraid it'll destabilize the grid. Now, they are allowing solar power because under the tariff structure, they can actually make money on somebody else's solar power. So they let that on the grid, and quite a lot's being built. But funny thing, Japan has nine times the high-grade renewable energy resources of Germany, and it's getting only a ninth as much of its electricity from renewables, not counting hydro, as Germany is. So again, opposite policies in Germany, they've maximized competition. They open the grid to all renewables. They have guaranteed access to the grid. They get paid a fair price that gives about a uh, 4 to 6% real return uh, until now. Now that's changing. Uh, and the utilities cannot refuse to accept the power. So in fact, in Germany, it's taken away their most profitable on-peak sales. Right. That's why they're in trouble. A lot of us tried to tell them this was going to happen, but they bet against it and they lost. And they want to be bailed out from bad strategy, which I think is bad policy, but anyway, it's their, it's their policy. Uh, so utterly different results. Germany had abundant electricity, uh, again, setting net export records for their power, particularly to France. They're a consistent net exporter to France. They have 384,000, as of last year, new renewable jobs. They have the strongest economy in Europe. Uh, their carbon emissions from the power sector have been generally constant or declining. The, uh, the reason they're not declining a lot faster is the record exports, which are chiefly coal-fired because of the collapse of the carbon pricing system in Europe 
and because uh, gas prices spiked and we dumped a lot of coal on them that we couldn't sell here, uh, so it looked like coal was cheaper than gas. But that's nothing to do with renewables or efficiency, and by the way, they're rapidly getting much more efficient too, fixing up their buildings. So it, it's a very impressive story, and the Forbes blog will give you more and document it to primary sources. Super, thank you. And when I put this in Asahi Shimbun, the business readers were quite astounded to read for the first time how disadvantaged their economy is by the policy their government has set. Right, right. So let's go domestic. Yep. So um, we, have, um, we have a meltdown in the nuclear business um, because of what happened in Japan. Um, no, 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 no. It was dead before that. <laughs> Well, well, it was slower before that. It wasn't it was, dead. It just, no, it, it was dead. There are no market <laughs> transactions in this business. The only reactors under construction, aside from finishing one in TVA, an unaccountable socialist entity, that, you know, that, that plant started in 72. But aside from that, the only ones under construction are under special state laws that give any upside to the investors, but all cost and all risk to the taxpayers and customers. Okay. That's not a market as we normally understand it. <laughs> so. and, and, and by the way, the nuclear business also was dead before Three Mile Island. Look at the December 28th, 78, four months before Three Mile Island, cover story in Business Week. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> to... We could have a, a debate on, on that, but I'm going to move on to something else because that's not where I wanted to go. Okay. Um, it's, where I wanted to go was, <laughs> was, you know, these things are happening. We're having a, we have a war on terror. People have talked about it being driven by our need for fossil fuels. We're having a collapse in, in Japan. You know, the nuclear business is going down. We're seeing a, a, a revitalization of drilling in North America. Big interest in you know focusing on fossil fuels and more efficient ways of extracting from the ground. Um, why why not continue that that journey? Why isn't that better for our economy for us to focus on that? Because it costs more and it has more risk. Uh, the drilling you're, you're referring, I assume, to gas fracking. Gas and oil. And oil, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's really driven by the oil part because that sells for four times as much as the gas. And the light sweet crude from the Bakken and the Eagleford and so on is, is, is in some wells, in some plays, and it's particularly valuable right now with Libyan light sweet off the market and you need it for a refinery blend stock, a lot of the older refineries. However, the oil part not only is rarer than the gas, but it depletes a lot faster. It's a 10 or 15 year bubble, after which you are face to face with dry gas economics, which are not good. It, it, you probably need at least six and a half bucks in general to make money on dry gas, and the dirty secret of fracking is how many companies have lost how many billion dollars uh, trying to frack gas in a market that just doesn't support the necessary prices. Yeah. Six and, and a half, that's, seven. And that's, yeah, that's, I think we, we all agree about that, and that's partly because uh, there's a, a, an initial fairly rapid production fall off from each well, but it, it doesn't then stabilize, it keeps going down at, at some rate, which requires you to refrack a lot more often than had been hoped, and therefore the cost goes up, even though the operations are getting ever more skillful. It's really not an easy business. I was a friend of George Mitchell who invented it with the help of some nice federal subsidies through 2002. Uh, and uh, it's a remarkable achievement. But there's several other attributes about it. Uh, it has about eight major kinds of cost and risk that'll take about a decade to play out. And if they all turn up trumps, then we'll have more and cheaper gas than we used to think. But eight's a pretty big number, so I wouldn't bet a whole lot of money on they're all coming out right. Uh, and that's okay, too, because we weren't going to need that much gas. Also, gas prices are inherently volatile, and the more, uh, in fact, I'll just throw up a quick slide about that. The, the more um, abundant and cheap the gas gets at the wellhead, uh, the uh, 
greater the volatility because you're driving uh, <clears throat> petrochemical pivots to gas and LNG exports and downstream bottlenecking in pipelines and so on. Now, the blue lines here are the 1985 through 2014 official forecasts of the real Henry Hub gas price. The green is the actual Henry Hub gas price. You see any connection? Uh, <laughs> so investors have lost a lot of money at, just on one of the three recent occasions. They've lost over $100 billion betting on gas price forecasts. This stuff is volatile. The cheaper it gets, the more volatile the price gets. Now, notice that the main competitors are efficiency and renewables, which are not volatile. They have a constant price. I will sell you, you know, wind power, solar power on a 20 or 25 year fixed nominal price contract. That's a declining real price. How much gas do you want to sell me uh, cheaply on those terms? None. You're smart, so you won't do that. And yet, when you properly count the market value of the volatility of the gas price, which you have to do for fair comparison, you've got to add about two bucks, which makes it even more out of the money. So there, there is an important story here about abundant, affordable energy supplies for the long haul, but the story is a lot less about gas than about its physical hedges, efficiency, and renewables that are outpacing it and outcompeting it to the extent that the... <clears throat> addition to oil supplies from the tight oil of fracking uh, are uh, less than half as important as the savings from more efficient cars and less driving in the same period. The carbon saving, which is canceled out anyway by export and other effects, but just narrowly counted, the carbon saving from the coal to gas switch in utilities is about half as big as the coal power displaced by efficiency in the same period. But since the fracking and generally supply industries owned about 99% of the microphones, <laughs> the message you hear is about the impressive increases in supply, not about the other stuff provided by other parties at much lower cost that's doing the job a lot faster. So I, I think actually all of the above is a political mantra, but it doesn't have an analytic basis. You can't afford every option, you don't need every option, and if you buy expensive stuff, you can buy a lot less cheap stuff with the same money. So you're actually making things worse than they should have been. So okay. sure, fracking should get to compete, and one of the things we have to do if we're to keep on with it uh, is to make sure we're not leaking out a bunch of gas, because if it's more than a few percent, uh, you're no better off than burning coal. Right, which leads me to coal. Yeah. Um, so, so this St. Louis is, is the coal capital of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard. And, um, uh, <laughs> and, and we're interested, you know, in the industry. Yeah. Um, where, does, where does that industry go um, as this world in which you're presenting to us uh, starts to materialize? Uh, well, down if its, uh, if its business model is to keep doing what they've been doing, which is to sell their asset for the lowest value use, namely burning it under boilers. Uh, I'm leaving aside metallurgical coal, which is a bit of a special case, but not a big number. Um, actually, aside from holding up the ground, the highest and best use of coal uh, <laughs> is, is, is to... Um, is to pull hydrogen out of steam. It's really good at that. And several very large coal producers in the world have been, with some advice uh, from us, reassessing their asset base through the lens of the hydrogen value chain. This is a special case of a much stronger argument around liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons that the hydrogen in the hydrocarbons is worth much more money without the carbon than with the carbon, even if nobody pays you to keep carbon out of the air. And the reason is you can use hydrogen much more efficiently than hydrocarbon. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that you'll make more money in general taking hydrogen out using a reformer than putting hydrogen in using a refinery. 
when I've been working in the oil business for 40 odd years, and when I first told that about 15 years ago to the majors, they scratched their heads a bit, then they did the math and they got the same answer. They're trying to figure out what to do about it. But let, let's look at the whole competitive landscape because I, I don't think most coal companies understand very well the competitive landscape that electric utilities face today or even how the grid works, like the grid integration stuff I sketched here. Uh, and that's rather worrying because you know, you really have to understand <laughs> where your customers are headed. The electric business is in profound transition and it is not going to keep burning a bunch of coal. We're even at the point where many, if not most, of the nuclear reactors in the country already built and paid for are uneconomic to run compared with the wholesale prices they face. And some of them are already starting to shut down for that reason. Just their operating costs can't compete. The same is increasingly true for coal. It isn't going to beat even the total cost of wind power whose average bid price last year was two and a half cents and as low as 1.8 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, solar is rapidly heading toward the same territory. The, the, so I, I think as with the oil and gas business, it's incumbent on strategists in the coal business to think about how to redeploy their skills and assets to thrive in a very, very different world, one dominated by energy efficiency, which almost none of them are tracking. Same as in the oil business. Uh, I just wrote an essay for Shell that will be published on Thanksgiving called Efficiency, the Rest of the Iceberg, uh, laying out the car story and other stories that their planners had missed. Uh, and you can run your supply side tanker into this iceberg, most of which you don't see because you're not looking for it, and sink and never know what you hit. Uh, it is disturbing to me, given the importance of the coal industry and the kinds of skills it has, uh, that it doesn't understand better who its competitors are. I, I had an article in Nuclear Engineering International about oh, five, six years ago that started with a really old story about the two guys who are up in the high arctic and one of them sees a giant bear galloping towards them and he starts lacing on his running shoes. Another guy says, what are you doing? That's futile. You can't outrun that bear. The guy dryly says, I don't need to outrun the bear. <laughs> but it, it's, it's really important to know whom you have to run faster than. And if you think that if, you, if you're in the coal business and you think you're competing with combined cycle gas plants or nuclear plants, you've completely missed what's going on in the industry. They're all uneconomic. Well, I didn't necessarily <laughs> want to end on that uh, <laughs> thought. Um, so I'm going to ask one for a quick answer to the, the following question, which is if you can think of you know, one or two sort of trans transformational things that need to occur to drive um, our, our collective planners to, to really push for this transformation. What needs to happen? What, what collective planners? Well, that's the whole point. There is none. But, Good. But, um, well, y yes or no, you talked about a plan, though, here. Well, I mean, in, in China, we work with the people who write the five-year plan because right. that's how their society does things. We, we work in a different way. And I, I celebrate that difference. Okay, so what is it that's going to encourage, um, I know what they're doing in California, I know what they're doing in Texas, but you have a lot of other states mm -hmm. that are, have almost a zero in renewable policy in place. It's, it's a very fragmented you know, um, economy. So oh. what are the one or two things that get us pushing towards a, a transformational <clears throat> thought regarding well, this the, work the two most important public policy innovations we could have, actually, I'll, I'll make it three. Uh, one is at the level of the regional transmission and grid organizations. They ought, as about 30 states now do, to allow uh, efficiency and demand response to compete directly against supply in the same auctions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when that happens, efficiency and demand and response tend to win. They're cheaper. Uh, secondly, 
the, I believe, 34 states that reward utilities for selling you more energy should switch over to rewarding them for cutting your bill. This is a reform called decoupling and shared savings. It has a profound effect on utility behavior, culture, and profitability. Uh, and thirdly, fee baits, which I mentioned early on for cars, enable the car buyer to use a social discount rate and look at the whole 15 years of life cycle fuel saving that, that matter to society, especially for national security, rather than looking just at the first year or two and whether you buy an efficient car is about as important as whether you buy floor mats. Uh, those, so the first of those is done at a regional level by existing technical organizations that run the grid, and the last two are uh, perfectly doable by a state legislature. Uh, you might start here since Missouri, like Colorado, is one of the states that uh, rewards the opposite of what we want in the utility business. And by the way, for any of you, let's say in real estate development, I know there are some here, who procure design services, see what happens if you pay your architects and engineers for what they save, not what they spend. It has a very salutary effect on design. Amory, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you.